I'm Judy Jordan, and I wanted to talk to you today about Gregor's Four Temperaments of Poetry, but I wanted to get to some old school chalkboard and chalk so that I could actually draw the grid on the board for you. You could see it instead of my just talking to you. So the last time we talked about Gary Soto's poem, Oranges, and we talked about how that's just a very clear story with a little bit of music and some imagination. There's a couple of similes and there's a final explosive, beautiful simile at the end where he compares the building the orange to building a fire in his hands. Okay, today I'm going to talk about something different. I want to talk about the imagination side of the board along with music and just a little bit of story. So this is how the grid comes out if you look at it like this. According to Gregor, and I think this is a great theory, you want to pull at least one thing from this side of the story, of the, the grid, story or form, and one thing from this side of the grid, music and imagination. When I first started writing, I was very much a story-oriented poet. My poems very much were a story, 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 and nothing else. And when Gregor explained this grid to me, and he said, you know, you have a great story, it's full of conflict, it's interesting, but you need to balance that story with something on this side of the grid. It will make for better poems. And he was right, absolutely correct. So when I started adding music, and by music I mean, I mostly mean assonance and alliteration, the repetition of vowels, the repetition of consonants. But music can also be other things. For example, an open meter, where your awareness of meter, but it's not a strict meter, and we can talk about that later. Um, I'll use a poem by James Kimball called Mount Pisgah to talk about that. And another type of music is, for me, at least the twisting of syntax, like something you would see in Robert Haynes' poems, Those Winter Sundays, when he begins, Sundays too, my father got up early. Instead of saying, Sundays also, my father also got up early on Sundays. He says, Sundays too, my father got up early. Or, an excellent example is Robert Frost. Instead of saying, I know whose woods these are, he says, whose woods these are, I think I know. Or, something there is that doesn't love a fence. So something there is that doesn't love a wall. I always forget. But the t twisting of the syntax is what makes that opening of the poem just so powerful. And that, I believe, is music at least in my opinion. Um, so when you're writing, you know, you want to have the story. But you know, what if you're a poet who really isn't all that interested in story? What if you're a poet who is more interested in music or imagination? Then you still want to have clarity of narrative. You want the reader to not be confused when they're reading your poems. So you need to somehow place your reader immediately in the poem. You can do that in the title. For example, Joelle Bill, in her first book, she has 14 poems in the middle of the book that are all 14 lines long. And they're all very much imagination-based. But the, you know what she's talking about in every poem because in every poem she tells you what she's talking about in the title. For example, one of the poems is called To a Mockingbird. And then she just goes through for 14 lines and gives you similes about mockingbirds. One's called to a spider, one's called to a heron, one's called to, a, to crows, one's called to a starlink. And so every poem, you know exactly what she's talking about. And every poem, she gives you all these wonderful imaginative similes, and then she stops after 14 lines. So she has this form, sonnet, the form of sonnet, to stop her. Because imagination is unlimited. You can just go on and on and on in writing similes. Because writing similes is fun. And if you're having fun writing similes, then you just want to keep going. So you need something to pull you in and stop you. So in Joelle Bill's poems, for example, she stopped by the sonnet form. And the story is more limited. The story has a beginning, a middle, an end. It has a conflict, but, and it is what happened. All right? So the story is going to be the limiting factor. Form is going to be a limiting factor because it's a sonnet or a villanelle or a sestina, but then these are unlimited. Music and imagination are unlimited. You can just have all the fun you want to with them and they just explode off the page. So music, assonance, old school chalkboard. This 
the liberation of Maya, the repetition of vowels and the repetition of consonants are what I just love to see in poems. And I tell my students there's only 26 letters in the English language, so it's not that hard to repeat them. So you ought to be able to do it. And I love to see that in poems. And I think that's what really will make a poem pop off the page. But I also love imagination. I love, for me, imagination is similes. There are other ways to get imagination. But for me, similes and metaphors are the most obvious way to get them. And I have this poem here. I'm going to put it in the comments. I'm going to type it up for you and put it in the comments. It's a poem called What the Dog Perhaps Hears. It's by LaSalle Mueller. Let me write that down for you. Well, I'll put that in the comments too. LaSalle Mueller, she's a wonderful poem. If you get a chance to check out her books, I highly recommend them. She won the Pulitzer for one of her books also. Um, but the poem begins immediately by telling you what the story is, or what the premise is. And the story is, the premise is, what can we imagine that the dog hears? And the first three lines are, if an inaudible whistle blown between our lips can send him home to us. And that's pretty much all the story is right there. She immediately invites you, the reader, in. She opens the door and says, this is what this poem is going to be about. It's going to be a poem of imagination. It's going to be a poem in which I imagine just the silent whistle, a whistle that's silent to us humans, can be heard by the dog. What else can the dog hear? So she invites the reader in with this very beautiful opening, the title, what the dog perhaps hears, and then the first three lines where she sets up the premise. And then she just goes on into imagination. <clears throat> What the dog perhaps hears. If an inaudible whistle blown between our lips can send him home to us, then silence is perhaps the sound of spiders breathing and roots mining the earth. It may be asparagus heaving head first into the light and the long brown sound of cracked cups when it happens. We would like to ask the dog if there is a continuous whir because the child in the house keeps growing, if the snake really stretches full length without a click and the sun breaks through clouds without a decibel of effort, whether in autumn when the trees dry up their wells there isn't a shudder too high for us to hear. What is it like up there above the shut-off level of our simple ears? For us, there was no birth cry. The newborn bird is suddenly here, the egg broken, the nest alive, and we heard nothing when the world changed. So you see what a wonderful poem that is. And it's just, it's full of imagination, just the idea of all the various things that the dog can hear. And you know, can it hear asparagus heaving head first? Can it hear the nest egg breaking? Can it hear the, the trees, the the well of water drying up and the trees shuddering. Can I hear the child constantly growing? It's this wonderful, just imaginative, just imagination after imagination after imagination. It's just unlimited. And then it also has, which I just love about it, is those beautiful sounds, like the long brown sound of cracked cups. The long brown sound of cracked cups. It's just mouth candy, the way that sounds. Just the repetition of vowel sounds. And then you have like asparagus heaving head first. So you have that repetition of the eight sounds, but what's even better about it is that wonderful verb. Instead of saying the asparagus growing, just just an average verb. She says the asparagus heaving, just such a more vibrant verb, it's so much stronger. So that's another thing that I learned about writing poetry, is they really pump up your verbs, it will make your poetry better. So instead of saying the rosemary growing along the fence, you can say the rosemary knuckled along the fence. So you get that uneven growth of rosemary, that ragged uneven growth. Um, and then you also have something just as gorgeous as the ending where she just says, you know, hey, the world, it's a miracle. You know, just the, the idea that this bird suddenly hear the egg broken, the nest alive, the world change. And we walking around, jaded, hanging out on our telephones. We didn't even notice, but the dog noticed. It's that, that just that joyous ending. 
It just makes this poem so much better. And it already was a beautiful poem because it's just such a wonderful premise. Just what does the dog hear if it can hear the sound of dog whistle? And she tells us that, she lets us into the poem, she opens the door and says, this is what the poem is about, and that's the story. And then she comes over here and gives us a little bit of music, just mouth candy, the long brown sound of cracked cups. And then there's the, the, all the imagination, hot on top of the imagination. So this poem, I think, is a great example of Greg Orr's grid, where you're drawing from both sides. You draw from the limited side, and you draw from the unlimited side. So you have a nice balance. And this is what I think your goal should be when you're writing poems. You want to have, if you don't want to write a strong story poem, just give the reader a little bit at the beginning, and then give them all the imagination and music you want. But just make sure that the reader's placed and they know where they are. But if you have a nice balance in your poem, your poem will be so much stronger. So that's the thing that I learned about Gregor's grid, of these four temperaments of poetry. And I, you know, I wanted to just give you this grid, how it looks when you draw it out. And this really helped my poems a lot. So I'm hoping it will help you. Um, and I'm also, I'm gonna come back and read some more poems and show you how they work based on the grid. The thing about this grid I found is you can work within it, but it still gives you so much freedom because you're not constrained by it. So it's something I hope you think about. Thanks for listening.